Thank you for joining us. Our guest today is a veteran former Israeli diplomat and advisor to several prime ministers. His historic involvement in the development of the State of Israel is profound. He fought in the War of Independence in 1948 and later served in many important diplomatic roles, including being Israel's ambassador to Great Britain. Ambassador Yehuda Avner is presently touring the United States on behalf of Israel Bonds, and he'll share his thoughts on past and present events in Israel's history following these messages. With us now is Israel Ambassador Yudha Avner. Sir, it's a real privilege and an honor to have you on the show. Shalom, thank you very much indeed. It's hard to believe that you're one of the few individuals, well, actually not so few, who are so profoundly involved with the history of the State of Israel. You, I understand, moved to Israel from England. You were there in the War of Independence and later served in so many capacities uh, in the diplomatic corps and so forth. What brings you to the United States at this time, sir? I'm here as a guest of the Israel Bonds Organization uh, to promote the sale of Israel Bonds, which is uh, to invest in the state of Israel through bonds. Uh, and uh, it is one of the most important instruments that we have whereby people in this country are able to connect with Israel, uh, not through a charity, but through an actual investment through Israel bonds. And all the, that investment is used for the, the infrastructure development of our economy, uh, which at the moment is very high tech, uh, very advanced, uh, one of the world leaders today in innovation and entrepreneurship in the field of high tech. Quite astonishing that is. It is indeed. I'd like to ask you to share some of your thoughts on the early days of the State of Israel. I'm going back to 1947 when I left my native Britain to fight the British in Palestine to help expel them so that we could establish a State of Israel. And in the early days, uh, the ship that brought me uh, from London to Marseille to Haifa was filled with uh, Holocaust survivors, many of whom did not have legal visas to enter the country. Uh, the country was governed by the British with a very harsh hand, I have to say, uh, and many of my fellow passengers upon arrival were arrested uh, and sent to a internment camp in Cyprus. So this was the atmosphere of the day. Uh, we were fighting against the British, we were fighting against the Arabs. Uh, there were different Jewish militias, one of which was called the Haganah, which was the largest one, one of which was called the Irgun, which was headed by Menachem Begin. Uh, there were times when there was almost civil war between them, but uh, there was not. I'm saying all this because there is a, a, a myth as if the War of Independence was a united uh, uh, insurgency of the whole of the Jewish community fighting together for a common cause. They were fighting to, for a common cause, but not always together. I will say that despite uh, our rather untidy and noisy uh, form of democracy that we have in Israel, it is a genuine democracy. And uh, the reason why uh, it seems so chaotic to the American eyes, our Knesset, um, is because uh, as a people, we come from uh, mainly from countries uh, where democracy was an eccentricity. I'm talking about um, the Arab countries, North Africa, Asia, uh, and uh, within a matter of a few years, thousands and hundreds of thousands and then millions 
came into the country. Uh, and our form of uh, election uh, is, is such that everybody has a voice. Uh, it is called proportionate representation as opposed to what you have in this country, which is called constituency representation. And in proportionate re representation, anybody who has 3% of the total electorate has a seat in our parliament, in our Knesset. Now, I assert that this has given everybody a safety valve. Having no democratic experience at all of the countries of their origin, the fact is that after 60 odd years of being under siege and war after war and blockade, we are a very vibrant and robust democracy. Yes, noisy and tidy, but a democracy we are. I find it interesting and amusing that you refer to the background that so many immigrants from Israel uh, the countries of their origins having a democracy regarded as an eccentricity. I think that's very interesting and of course true. And this eccentricity continues in all of the Arab countries uh, to a worse degree than that actually. And uh, we see a changing Middle East right now which uh, could be promising or could be threatening. What are your thoughts? Well, it does contain both uh, opportunity uh, and indeed, a uh, threat uh, to Israel. Uh, the change that is taking place is quite remarkable. The question is, what form is it going to take? Uh, there is a myth uh, that if you have an, e uh, an election, then automatically you have a democracy. A, an election in and of itself does not a democracy make. An election is a mechanism whereby you give people the opportunity to express themselves. But if those expressions are not rooted in a constitution that guarantees the individual rights and all the freedoms that we democracies cherish, and the freedom of speech and the freedom of assembly and the independence of the judiciary and the rule of law, uh, then uh, what you will have at the end result of an election could be what has happened in Lebanon. There was an election, but who came into power? Hezbollah, which then destroyed all concepts of the freedoms we cherish. Or we had an election, say, in Gaza, and who came into power? Hamas. Again, a fundamentalist, jihadist group. Uh, there was an election in Iran, who came into power? The Ayatollahs. Uh, thus it is that it, uh, it is naive to think that if you have an election, you know, people say yes, but they were elected in a free election. So was Hitler elected in a free election in 1933. What matters is not the first election, but the second election. Does those who enter office in power in the first election consent that after X number of years they will again stand to the test of public opinion. And, in my view, there is one word which is the measure and the test of what a true democracy is. And that word is tolerance. Do you have the tolerance to tolerate the point of view of the other with which you do not agree. That is democracy. Ambassador Abner, you are making some very fascinating points and uh, it is not easy to discuss the background of the, the history of the Middle East conflict and the mentality and, uh, of the uh, inhabitants of many of the countries in a matter of a short interview. There's so many viewpoints. Some people say that many people are not educated enough to be capable of appreciating the liberties that some countries afford. And interesting how they actually break agreements and contracts they make with each other also. Tell us a little bit about the reliability of Arab regimes. 
Well, many of them have are, are tribal, and their allegiances uh, are first and foremost to their own tribe, rather than to the conglomerate of the state. Uh, this was seen now most particularly in Libya. Uh, uh, those who are uh, fighting in order to save uh, Gaddafi, uh, the madman of the Middle East, as uh, uh, he has been described, uh, uh, they belong to his tribe. Uh, when you come to other cities, uh, like Benghazi and so forth, they are a different tribe. Uh, what I caution against is a tendency in some capitals, not least in Washington, to graft onto the Middle East the Western value systems, uh, which uh, we've seen it in, to a degree in Iraq, we're seeing it in Afghanistan, uh, the notions of nation building and democracies uh, in these areas, uh, they simply don't work. They have to find in their own language, in their own cultures, uh, at their own pace, uh, the possibility of turning their monologues into dialogues. Uh, and that's that's a process. It can be a generational process. It can take a very long time. The question is, how do we maintain, how does the West assist uh, in maintaining stabilities in the region? Uh, a region which, by a quirk of geology, is sitting on the largest energy reservoir in, in the world. Uh, and therefore, in order to maintain the flow of that oil and that energy, uh, democracies, not least the United States, find themselves sitting in bed with all kinds of tyrants, uh, simply in order to keep the oil flowing. But this is a real politic. Uh, it is not uh, Wilsonian idealism. Uh, the, we, Israel, have a role to play. Uh, we are a very small country. Uh, most Americans would be astonished to realize how small we are. We are a sliver of territory on the eastern seaboard of the Mediterranean Sea, and we are bounded by 32 Arab states from the Persian Gulf to the, the Atlantic Ocean, a landmass larger than the United States. We are less than 40 miles wide. Uh, our population is approximately 6 million. We're surrounded by 300 million plus Arabs, a population larger than the United States. And they have armies, vast armies. And they have wealth, natural wealth, vast natural wealth. And the good Lord gave us a promised land with virtually no natural resources at all to speak of, except one, and that was this. He gave us brains. And we have had to use those brains very shrewdly in order to survive in this area. Uh, the consequence of which is now our economy. Just absolutely amazing. Also, I have to say, before we go to a commercial break, I must offer my thoughts. I've rarely heard the situation described as brilliantly, and I want to thank you for that. We'll continue right after these messages. We are back with Ambassador Yehuda Avner. Sir, I want to take this opportunity to thank you for your book. Ambassador Yehuda Avner's new book, The Prime Minister's An Intimate Narrative of Israeli Leadership, has been described as a very heavy book, but a book one cannot put down. On the cover we see uh, various prime ministers. We see Golda Meir, Rabin, Begin. Tell us a little bit about Levi this book. Eshkol. Levi Eshkol, of course. Uh, yes. Well, I've been a member of uh, our foreign service, your State Department, 
uh, since the mid-1950s, and very early on, I was seconded uh, to the Prime Minister's office, uh, not least because the Prime Minister of the day, whoever he was, uh, needed my language skills. And so I began in the early 1960s with Levi Eshkol, uh, and with him, I went through the trauma and the victory of the Six-Day War of 1967. And then I worked for Golda Meir, and with her, I went through the trauma and the victory of the Yom Kippur War of 1973. And then with the Yitzhak Rabin, uh, with him, I went through the trauma and the victory of the rescue operation of Entebbe, uh, of which we don't have time to elaborate upon now. Uh, and then with Menachem Begin, I, I went through the blessed process of the peace process between ourselves and the Egyptians. Uh, 1979, we signed the accord. <clears throat> this was the first peace treaty we had concluded with an Arab state. Egypt, the largest, the most powerful, the most influential, militarily the strongest of all the Arab states. Indeed, Egypt numerically is almost half of the Arab world. With that Egypt, we made peace. And having made peace with Egypt, and this was followed by peace with Jordan, um, we broke the cycle of violence uh, in terms of the capacity of the Arab armies collectively to invade us. Why? Because Egypt, being the largest of all the Arab states, there had never been a war which was launched against us, which Egypt wasn't the launcher, and then the other Arab states followed. Neither did a war ever end with which Egypt was not the first to pull out, and then the other Arab states followed. With that Egypt, we made peace. The question that now hovers over everybody's mind is, Given the revolution that has taken place in Egypt, will our peace treaty with that country hold? The fact that the governance of the country has been handed over to the army, the army, in principle, has a vested interest in maintaining that peace treaty with Israel. But at the same time, you have the long shadow of Iran, which is a nuclear Iran, which is almost ready to manufacture its bomb and perhaps try a lucky strike at Tel Aviv. Iran is trying to infiltrate into Egypt and take control through a Trojan horse that's called the Muslim Brotherhood. Fascinating. Uh, and uh, our message to our friends in the West, not least in the United States, is stop Iran, block Iran. If you stop, block Iran in its tracks, most of the Arab capitals who are Sunnis, uh, Muslims, Arabs, Iran is not an Arab country. They will say, God bless America. So Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, is trying to slowly infiltrate, as it, as it has been said so many times, and the world is just simply, really, and the United Nations, just doing nothing. Well, it's not that slowly. He's, he's taken over Libya, I'm sorry, Lebanon, through Hezbollah, which is a proxy of uh, Iran. He's taken over the Gaza Strip through Hamas, which is a proxy of Iran. It is now going to try and take over Egypt through the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a proxy of Iran, and so on and so forth. If Iran succeeds, the total balance of power in the Middle East will change, and by extension, the balance of power between the Islamists, the jihadists, I don't want to say the whole of the Muslim world, but those radical elements within the Muslim world who they see as the West as their enemy. Iran has got three strategic goals. 
One is to dominate the whole of the Middle East. Two is to serve as a catalyst of all the Islamist regimes against the West, most no notably America. And three, to destroy Israel. This is war. And not all American public opinion fully understands. This is my anecdotal impression. I may be, might be wrong. That understands the extent of the threat to the West that would emanate out of a man becoming the dominant power in the Middle East. I'd like to ask you about another war, which is the media war, the informational war. Even back in World War II, the Nazis were good at propaganda, and um, propaganda and misinforming the masses leads to certain circumstances. What are your thoughts with regard to the media war and increasing anti-Semitism, which is now called uh, perhaps anti-Zionism? What are your thoughts on the media war? First of all, where do people get their information from? They get the overwhelmingly the information from the television screen. And television deals with pictures, with images, not necessarily with intellectual facts. And images bespeak to the sentiment, not to the mind. And there are certain images to which there's no answer. Uh, they are so overwhelming in the emotional impact. You take the image of the Arab mother clinging a child to her breast, and there is an Israeli tank. Uh, to that, there's no answer. The, you never see the camera pan out to give it context. The context of that little tiny country called Israel, so small that the cartographer has got to spill half its name into the Mediterranean Sea, surrounded by this vast land mass of 22 states and over 300 million Arabs, all of whom are sworn to destroy this little Israel. And the fact that people do not see the broader context, but only see what they consider the imagery of the bully, Israel, against his poor, helpless Palestinian woman. This woman is not helpless. This woman has the possibility of appointing, of, 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 of uh, electing leadership that will reach compromises with us in order to establish peace. The overwhelming majority of the Israeli public today is in favor of a two-state solution, Israel and Palestine. The fact is that we, the overwhelming majority, are saying to the Palestinians, we recognize you have national rights in this land. The Palestinians refuse to recognize that Israel is a legitimate nation state of the Jewish people. Okay. In my words, the legitimate nation state of the Jewish people. In other words, we too have legitimate historic rights in that land. So I'd like to dwell again on the media war, the image war, and the lies by omission. Again, I like bringing up the example of the Lebanon war in which Israel finally retaliated after so many weeks of restraint after being bombarded by um, terrorist missiles. And when Israel finally retaliated, the West had the chutzpah, the insolence to say that Israel's response was disproportionate. How fascinating it is that one could use the word disproportionate as a device to lie and make it appear that the victim, Israel, was the oppressor. Mm -hmm. and typical propaganda. What are your thoughts on the image war? The public is ignorant. And there is an elitist uh, in uh, particular on campuses, uh, there is uh, an elitist thrust of people uh, who, can, who are saying the most outrageous things about us and are justifying the most outrageous atrocities of the Islamists against us. 
uh, the world is turned on its head, which is why I attach importance to a program such as yours, such as Shalom, which seeks to educate the people in depth uh, uh, across the country, that in order at least they should be informed, they can draw their own conclusions. But you are embarked upon an exercise of informing people as to the realities that Israel is facing. Agree or disagree with what you say. You have to carry on with this work of spreading the information across this country. To this day, I cannot understand why, whereas the Arabs have an Al Jazeera worldwide, the Jewish world has not come together to create its own equivalent worldwide. So in the absence of that, we have to rely on programs such as Shalom to do this work. Ambassador Abner, this has been a real great honor and a privilege having you on the show. Thank you so terribly much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The best of luck. Thank you. I'll be right back. This brings us to the end of our special show for today. I'm Richard Peretz. Thank you for being with us. Mm -hmm.